Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I go through the current state of my Sunday sermon. Last week, we ended with Christians going into the sea, did a little mashup with the original Jaws movie and Peter's um, experience, the vision of the sheet coming down and meeting Cornelius, and this little bit of movement out into the far larger sea with its sea monsters of the Roman Empire. Christians must still go into the sea, and it's not beyond criticism. It still requires faith. We take a long time to sort out the issues, and we follow the Holy Spirit. And, of course, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men, and that's, in fact, what Peter did. But they still get eaten by the Daniel 7 sea monsters out there in the sea. Now, the Internet is, in some ways, a sea of people, and... um, One of the things that I do on my channel is I have randos conversations where I talk to people basically about um, where they're at, their quests for a spiritual home. That's where many of these things go. Uh, People's stories of their lives on the sea are fascinating and tragic and glorious and sometimes ordinary and sometimes exciting. And I really enjoy talking to people about their stories and hearing their stories. And, of course, as a Christian, I believe um, our God is God of the sea and God of the dry land and God of the estuary, in fact. And I'm going to get my cursor back. Here we go. Now, Now, Cornelius, as we noted last week, was a border figure. He was a Gentile who was very Jewish curious, and he was blessing the synagogues in a very border place of Caesarea built by Herod the Great. And this was very important for Peter's own development as the Holy Spirit led the church increasingly out into the sea. Now this week we will see Paul of Tarsus, and this is an anticipation of, we'll have some sermons on the book of Romans. Those of you who don't know, I go through the book of Romans in my adult Sunday school class where we go into an, into it in a lot more depth. Now, now Paul, of course, is, is also sort of a border figure because he's uh, part of the Jewish diaspora, but he was born in Tarsus, so he's also a Roman citizen. He was trained by the best Jewish teachers of his time. He was an apostle in Jerusalem. The, the apostles in Jerusalem had sent him and Barnabas up to Antioch, where they had an outbreak in the church of a church not started by a group of synagogue leaders. In other words, many of the early churches sort of start as a synagogue and there's a split. You can watch this in the book of Acts, but the council in Jerusalem didn't quite know what to do with this group of people in Antioch who were being called Christians for the first time. It seemed to be sort of more of a purely Gentile church. So Paul and Barnabas go up there and begin leading that church and become part of that church And then Acts 13 has a record of the church at Antioch. And um, now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, um, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up um, with Herod the Tetrarch. So you have people of, of high status, people from all over the world. Antioch is an important city. It's a cosmopolitan city. And Saul, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. After they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Where they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John, John Mark, was with them as a helper. And you can see from the little map here, those of you who are watching, that that Cyprus is this island a little ways off the coast. They traveled through the whole island until they came to, to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant to the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of the Lord, the word of God. But, but Elimus, the sorcerer, for that was what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the, from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? 
Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time, not able to see the not not able to see, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Now, this seems to be a very hopeful sign where you have Paul 1, Sea Monster 0, where suddenly, the first off the bat here, this guy believes in Jesus. He's a high-status Roman in charge of the island, and this, this one particular individual was leading him astray, and he's struck blind. The seer is now blind and has to be led, about, led around by someone else. The guy who was leading everyone else around now can't even lead himself around. So from Perga, so then they left and went to Perga, and from Perga they went to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. This is their practice. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leader of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God. So here you have sort of a mixed company again. Listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the, sign of the time of Samuel the prophet. And the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled forty years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Well, there'll be some of that and some of the other. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the, the Savior Jesus as he promised. So right away... Paul sets up the relationship between Jesus and David. And now the Philistines in some ways are sea monsters that come up on land and colonize Israel and oppress them. This sermon in Acts 13 is the first major sermon by Paul. And it's sort of an example sermon of when he goes from synagogue to synagogue. This is likely sort of, sort of his stump sermon, the sermon he preaches from place to place. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. That's John the Baptist. And as John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. As you can see all along the way, Paul is setting up the story for Jesus to come as the promised anointed one to Israel. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. Hmm, there's that word salvation. I have to think more about what that word means. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophet that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news, that God promised our ancestors, what God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. So very clearly on, the resurrection is center in the message. And again, this will be consistent with Paul and Peter throughout the book of Acts. The good news is that Jesus has risen from the dead, and this connects into their world. It is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father, Psalm 2. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. Now, this is a big deal because the Greeks notice that, well, everything in this world seems to decay. Well, maybe there's another world where things don't decay. That must be a better world. And so often they posited that there's sort of a good God who made the world, the immaterial world, the spiritual world without decay. And perhaps there was a lesser God who made the material world. And the Jews said no. And the proof of this is that 
God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. This is creation 2.0. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessing promised to David. Again, a connection to David. So it is also stated everywhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Psalm 16 verse 10. Now when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. In other words, David was not the fulfillment of that promise. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Jesus is the new and better David. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. I would probably put in there because it's the same Greek word. Everyone who trusts is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. And we're going to come back to that a little bit later. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. If we're riffing on the Jaws theme, it's almost like, well, a bigger boat is going to be given because, well, what happened with Moses was God bringing himself into the world, but that only given so far, now something new is coming to complete it. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. This was a very strange word indeed. It's Jesus of Nazareth, the promised son of David, rising from the dead, no longer to decay. Let's hear more. When the congregation was dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. So in other words, word spread fast. A lot of people are curious about this. These new visitors are quite strange. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Now, I can very easily imagine how this happens. I hear at Living Stones preaching every week, plenty of empty chairs, people nodding off during the sermon. Suddenly, a couple of, uh, couple of new people come in town. They have a very different thing to say. Everybody listens carefully and then says, come back next week, let's hear more. And then they all go and they tell their friends. And then, how would I feel? Well, every week I'm here preaching to these people and, you know, we just get a few sleepy, drowsy people come. These people show up and the whole town wants to hear. Well, I would probably be pretty annoyed. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. This isn't like what happened in Cyprus. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and did not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. They're going deeper into the sea, this sort of, this sort of estuary place, perhaps, that the synagogue was. They're going, nope, we're going out into the open ocean. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Paul sees himself as a fulfillment to the prophecy. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. It was effective. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. Well, this is a big turnaround from what we saw in Cyprus. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went on to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And this will be the pattern of the book of Acts. Paul will preach, some will believe, some will resist. Sometimes there's trouble from Romans, sometimes there's trouble from Jews. On it goes, off they go to the next town. Is it clear? No. But it's a beginning, and it's a colonization, often in Roman colonies. Philippi is a Roman colony, and things will begin to go. 
It sets in motion a very long process that will continue, in fact, for centuries. The Gentile church will grow far larger than the initial Jewish seed. And it will often happen, well, at the bloodshed of the people. The nature and remedy of the chaos and the sea and its monsters will get addressed. And this is that strange verse. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Now, this is kind of a curious verse because some of you might read it and say, well, have I been set free from every sin? I still sin. I still struggle with sin. What on earth can that mean? A justification, there's a long word, that you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. In other words, Paul is saying to this mixed group and then to the Gentiles that something has come with this that is a new breakthrough. It's something that goes beyond what had been offered to you and something that's going to have a bigger transformative movement into the future. And we're going to see that. In fact, we're going to see that when we get to the book of Romans, which we will get into next week which begins with very much a similar idea. Paul says to the book of Romans, to a Roman church that is mostly Gentile, a few Jews in it, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. See, same theme. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. You can see how this connects what he said at Pisidian Antioch. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And so I have an adult Sunday school class on the book of Romans, and we've been in the book of Romans 45 weeks, so that's about 45 hours of video if you really want to go into it. A righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the wicked godlessness and wickedness of people. Is that the sea? Are those the monsters? Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Romans 1, he'll talk about the Greeks or the Gentiles. Romans 2, he'll talk about the Jews. Romans 3, he'll put everybody on a level playing field. And Romans 4, he'll go back to Abraham. What you see in this passage is that we learn to talk about it usually after we live into it. Right away, there's this inkling, and you'll see it with a verse from, from earlier in the book of Acts from Ananias, that Paul is going to go out into the sea. These, in some ways, are, are natural waters for Paul. Paul was born into the broader Roman Empire. He was used to the cult of Caesar Augustus. He was used to all of the things that are going on in the empire, and he was trying to live as a righteous Pharisee in it. And then, of course, he was persecuting the, the diaspora elements in Jerusalem of the early church, trying to track them down not too far from Jerusalem where they sort of spread out. And then, of course, God comes to him on the road to Damascus and a new insight comes and a new calling comes and an entirely new mission comes. He too, of course, will be eaten by the shark. We are still in a watery world. In fact, you have the Christianization of the Roman Empire, but the world is larger than that, and on and on and on the story goes. The process is the same. Conversation. We talk to people who have hungry hearts, and whether they're Christians looking for more guidance, or whether they're non-Christians, or whether they're just sort of feel like they're in the middle and they're not exactly know what to do, whether they've had a bad experience with the church or unsure of a church or have questions about church, into the water we go, into the conversations we go, and we talk and we listen and we learn to love. Paul at Cyprus, big win. Paul at Pisidian Antioch, how to evaluate. Leaves behind some believers. A church begins, but... Others resist. 
and off they go to a new town. Same pattern. Always, it seems, watery, confusing, very seldom clear, often patient, hoping, hoping in faith, something turns, something changes, God breaks through. How to engage people in their quest for a spiritual home? Well, everybody has a hungry heart. That's usually where we start. We still haven't found what we're looking for, and even people in the church struggle with that. But the center of the message is always Christ crucified and the risen Lord. The center of Peter's message to Cornelius before God's outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon them. The center of the church of Antioch as they send out Paul and Barnabas. The center of the message of Paul to the church at in Antioch. Becomes bo- this becomes a bone of contention. Can we believe? Is, this, is it possible? How does it relate to Moses? How does it relate to the world? How does it relate to the sea monsters? How does it relate to all of the issues that are sort of out there in the watery sea that wasn't on the island of God's holy land and God's chosen people? How does it impact the world we see it today? For Sergio Paulus, bang, there it was, clear as day. For the others in Pisidian Antioch, there would be wrestling. There would be swimming. There would be fighting. There would be fleeing. We do have a bigger boat. A bigger boat would arise out of all of this. We still suffer for his name. Remember Acts chapter 9? Saul, Jesus interrupts Saul on the road to Damascus. Ananias is very reluctant to go meet this man who has been killing. Paul has been a sea monster. He's been killing these new disciples of Jesus. And what does, what does the Lord say to Ananias? But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. He is risen to no longer decay, and we will be raised like him. The nature of the sea will be changed. You can read about that in the book of Revelation. In the Christian Reformed Church, we have this song, By the Sea of Crystal, Saints in Glory Stand. We who are formerly monsters can bear witness to the change. That's Paul. We will be like him. Amen.